Okay, cool. All right. Hey guys, um, I'm Trevor, and uh, I'm doing my talk on Python for quantifying cardiovascular function. So um, I just uh, I just finished a master's project looking at relationship between um, brain blood flow regulation and systemic blood pressure regulation. Uh, so our whole thing was looking at the different systems uh, that regulate blood flow and blood pressure throughout the body and to different organs and whatnot. Uh, so this is important because all the, the tissue in your body needs constant delivery of oxygen and nutrients. Uh, without this, um, you know, all of your vital organs, your brain, your heart, liver, everything will fail. Um, so, yeah, my, my background, I, I don't really, I don't come from a uh, computer science background originally, but um, studying the human body got me really interested in what tools you can use to do better analysis, basically. Um, so normally when you go into the doctor, uh, they'll, like, it's pretty common, they'll measure your blood pressure. Uh, this is a you know, it's a static measurement, and it's just a one-off. They'll say, you know, if your blood pressure is 120 over 80, you're healthy. If your blood pressure is 160 over 90, you're not, not doing so hot. Um, but the problem with this simplistic measure is it doesn't tell you anything about the moment-to-moment -moment variation or how your body can adapt to that. So if you look at this, um, this bottom graph here, this is a real blood pressure trace from our lab. Um, and granted, for this one, we did inject drugs to make their blood pressure drop and rise pretty quick. But um, <laughs> so they uh, basically, you look, um, if you were to measure this guy's blood pressure at uh, 1,700 seconds versus 1,740 seconds, that's quite a discrepancy. So. Um, you know, I, I went and got my blood pressure checked at a physical before I started my last job, and I was late. I had already slammed three cups of coffee that morning and had run there from the train, and my blood pressure was through the roof, and the nurse was worried, but it's, you know, it's totally different than it was. The plot? So this plot, this is a blood pressure plot. Um, this is a continuous waveform. I'll show you um, some close-ups of it later. But basically, um, you know, we're so used to thinking of blood pressure as like a high and a low, right? Well, this is the continuous pulsatile flow, which is recorded from a, um, a device on the finger that records at seven, uh, 1,000 hertz. So you're getting 1,000 data points per second as opposed to just two data points for it's a line plot, yeah, right. And so the, um, the green, red, and light blue, those are all calculations I've done in Python that calculate the systolic mean diastolic. Um, so just looking at um, blood pressure, that's a static measurement of the brachial artery in the arm. Uh, if you go a step further above that, you've got a system called the baroreflex, which regulates systemic blood pressure. And then with the local, um, arterial beds surrounding vital organs, such as the brain, you've got things like cerebral autoregulation, which um, modulate arterial diameter to control flow. Um, so, you know, someone that could have a specific blood pressure and their blood flow to their brain could be not necessarily representative of what the blood pressure is. Uh, so one of the, the big things that I focused on in our lab was the barrel reflex. So basically, it works as a negative feedback loop. Um, so you've got, you see this graph, this picture here. Um, for um, arterial blood pressure, going through the aortic arch in the heart and carotid arteries in your neck, there's sensors that detect change. So if there's an increase or decrease in blood pressure, um, these nerves will send signals to the brain to change heart rate and arterial diameter. And so that's, the, that's one of the big things we were looking at is assessing how quickly a person's body can adapt to those changes. Um, so let's see here. Uh, yeah, so you know, bl blood pressure is a product of cardi uh, cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. So cardiac output 
that's related to heart rate and amount of blood that's pumped out for each each heartbeat. And then total peripheral resistance, that has to do with the um, change in arterial diameter. So if, uh, you know, if, if blood pressure goes up, the arteries can dilate and that helps to bring pressure down. So basically the idea is the quicker that your body can do that, the more healthy you are, in theory. Um, so in our lab, we um, are able to quantify this by making a number of measurements at the same time. So we had, uh, we had transcranial Doppler ultrasound measuring brain blood flow on the subject. We had uh, ECG trace to get the heart rate and uh, the cuff I was talking about for the blood pressure on the finger. And in addition to that, we also had uh, a nasal line getting end tidal CO2 and oxygen. Uh, we inserted microelectrodes into the peroneal nerve in the knee. So it's, a, it's a, this, basically a needle sticking a centimeter into her leg, <laughs> into a nerve. And it's basically like trying to stick a pencil tip into a pencil tip. So it takes us about an hour and a half to get it in the right spot. Uh, and, and then we start our test. But uh, so it's, uh, it's there's a, yeah, <laughs> there's a bit of a disconnect between what we can do in the lab and what we can just do walking around day to day. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, it's pretty amazing to me what, what you can read from these signals. So we do a number of tests where we just look at them, their spontaneous baseline fluctuations in everything and how they relate to one another. Then um, the drug injections I talked about, there's a cannular line in the arm where we inject nitroprusside and phenylephrine to get a quick drop and rise in blood pressure. And then um, inflating thigh cuffs, that basically cut off circulation of the legs and then deflating them and watching what happens as blood flows back to the legs. Um, so it sounds a bit barbaric, like saying it out loud, but that's uh, <laughs> what I did for two years. <laughs> uh, so here's a close-up of the measurements we'd make. So we did this, it's all records to a program called Lab Chart. I'm sure there's other ways to do it as well, but um, this is all time aligned together. So we've got the heart ECG trace, CO2, oxygen, blood pressure, two brain blood flow channels, and the nerve activity, which corresponds to the constriction of arteries. Uh, so I, when I started working in this lab, I was involved with data analysis. I didn't have any programming skills, but I it basically got delegated to me to make the analysis program for the barrel reflex. And I kind of went off the deep end on LabVIEW. And I just, show of hands, how many are familiar with LabVIEW? A handful. So this is kind of, I didn't realize, but I feel like not a lot, not everyone, like it, it's not as common as I thought it would be, but I guess in physiology, a lot of people do use it. Um, it was pretty easy to dive into, or at least not be intimidated by, it because the back panel, what you're, instead of writing code, you're basically making a circuit board. So while loops and for loops are funny looking boxes with lines coming in and out of them and whatnot. Um, but in, so, to start out, it's pretty easy, but then it's pretty easy to turn it into a big rainbow spaghetti nightmare that is that takes a while to debug. Um, and in addition to that, after like leaving my master's, you know, I, to get a license for this, it's three grand. If you want some of the extra modules, it's gonna be six grand. If I wanna um, basically give someone else another lab a copy of my software to use. They also have to have a license. And this is, it's kind of the same for MATLAB as well. But um, those two programs are very common in the uh, like biomedical research. So I kind of, I started reading around and kind of got interested in Python. I read um, Python for Data Analysis, which was uh, Wes McKinney's book, and became really interested. And so the big thing, Switching to Python was just that it's, it's open source, which is obviously awesome. And I was surprised just how many um, different libraries there were to use and just how powerful it can be. Um, so also on top of that, there's a huge support community. Like I've been going to New York Python meetups and just looking online, 
if you've got a, a problem you're struggling on, someone else has had the same problem at some point. Uh, and also, um, just looking at like the, the popularity of Python is growing. This is off of GitHub. They're, they quantify popularity based off of search queries. And so just my thought is the more people using it equals more libraries coming out, more support. So just it's a good spot to be in, definitely. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll switch over to my notebook here. Um, but the one of, one of the big things to me was the was pandas and specifically the data frames because I'm working with so many channels of data. It's easy to take all of that and quickly relate different channels to one another and easily aggregate multiple channels at the same time. Uh, yeah. So we'll just run this. And so this first part is just importing a text file as a data frame. And so you see here, this is the text file that was an output from that lab chart program. And it's just three channels. I've got the, I've only taken out the time and seconds, uh, the ECG and blood pressure traces. And so you can easily import that into a data frame and tell it what columns to use, what um, what to label the index, what to label the like each column. And so the next thing, the first thing I wanted to do was quantify when each heartbeat happens. And so to do that, basically it's like a local maxima of the ECG. So each time you have that peak, it's called the QRS complex. It's uh, that's basically when the heart is contracting and sending blood out to the body. So it, I kind of wrestled with it for a little bit because the signal uh, has a lot of high frequency noise. And so basically what I was doing was, was um, saying for points that are above a specific threshold and are greater than the previous point and the next point, that would be when, when the QRS complex was. But as you can see up here, there's multiple points just because of the noise. So I ended up using um, the Butterworth filter in SciPy, and it, it basically, to be honest, I basically copy-pasted the, <laughs> the example they had to use it in SciPy, and it, it took like two minutes to set up, and all the high-frequency noise was gone. So that was, uh, that was a really good day. Uh, <laughs> um, So, yeah, so, the, yeah, so th this part here, this is, this is that what I was talking about. And basically it's just um, a low pass filter and I then added it to the data frame. So just give it a column name, say it equals the filtered ECG, which is, you know, our end result of our Butterworth low pass filter. So from there, we're able to quantify when each heartbeat happens a lot easier. And so I just made this threshold here. And just because like each, each subject, the, the baseline for the ECG is going to be a little bit different. I can't just give it a specific number. And so I made basically a threshold. I used um, NumPy max and min to calculate a percentage of it's a percentage height of the total of the signal. So for each each um, each file I use, I've got a new threshold that's automatically detected. And then, like I said earlier, um, the the basic principle of determining when that QRS complex is is finding out when when a data point is greater than the previous and next point, and basically append that to um, its own list. And so from that, basically with all of this, like each time there's a new local maxima, it becomes the first point for a new heartbeat. And then all following, all, all following points are labeled as the same heartbeat until you get to a new one and so forth. So this makes it really easy to say um, what is the 
mac local what's the maximum blood pressure for heartbeat zero or what's the minimum what's the mean so that that's how you're able to basically calculate uh, local values and so the the heart rate is calculated as 60 divided by the RR interval which is the difference between each point and so you can see that right here but basically we're calculating just time between each heartbeat and so as like as um, you know basically as your blood pressure drops the the barrel reflex is sending a signal to increase the heart rate so the time between each heartbeat is gonna decrease um, so we've got our heart rate calculation right here and then from that can then calculate the local max mean and min which is the systolic mean and diastolic blood pressures for each heartbeat and so from this I've made an output data frame again it's, I, I find this really useful really easy to just make a from scratch a new data frame that's got all of my data so for each heartbeat I've got what time it happened what the R interval is what the heart rate systolic mean diastolic blood pressure is but from there we're not quite done yet um, to quantify how sensitive the system is, we need to basically bucket by systolic blood pressure. So what we're looking at is relationship between the time between each heartbeat and the systolic blood pressure. And to do this, there's, um, I, I don't know if you guys saw the um, pandas talk a little bit earlier. Uh, but there is a group by function. I was working at that for a little bit. I ended up making my own that basically appends, um, it makes the three millimeter mercury bins. And it just, um, it just made more sense to me. But basically I've got bins corresponding to each um, blood pressure range. And so from that, Sorry. Um, okay. So basically, I've got the bin values. We'll, we'll graph that in just a moment. But also with pandas, um, it's really easy to quickly calculate something for all the channels. So I here I've calculated the average heartbeat, uh, how how long the total recording was, average R interval, average heart rate, and then average blood pressure values and number of bins, so there's seven bins. And then from this, calculate linear regression. And you can see here, this is, um, I mean, it's all kind of scrunched together here, but basically a close up is you've got your ECG and blood pressure, and along the way you've got the changes, you've got your local maxima, and then you can calculate what the relationship between the two is. I don't know why that changed. <laughs> uh, just a moment ago, this um, fit. So, sorry about that. Let me see if I can fix that. Apologies, bear with me. Okay, there we go. I don't know what just happened, but I just restarted <laughs> kernel and it works. Um, so you can see here we've got um, systolic blood pressure versus time between each heartbeat. So as systolic blood pressure drops, on average, you have a decrease between the time between each heartbeat. So this is basically the system, as blood pressure is dropping, it's telling, it, it's telling the heart to increase heart rate to bring the blood pressure back up. So basically, in the lab, what we're calculating, or we're doing all this just to get this slope value. And the greater the slope, the greater the increase in heart rate per drop 
in blood pressure. So basically, the sensitivity tells how quickly a person's heart can react and help to buffer the changes in blood pressure. So um, from here, I, I kind of I had high hopes for this talk. I really wanted to get the sympathetic arterial portion. It's, uh, it, it's a little more work. I've done it in LabVIEW before. But basically, it's, it's the same process. We're just um, we're calculating the, the average integrated area of each burst corresponding to heartbeats in each blood pressure bin. And it just, um, just time-wise, it's going to take me a little bit longer. Uh, also, there's a number of ways to measure cerebral autoregulation, and that's all relationships between the blood pressure signal and the brain blood flow velocities. And so it's um, just using, using tools like pandas, it, it's quick and easy to aggregate the data. It's, it's easy to manipulate different channels based on another channel on the same table. And um, yeah, that, uh, it's an awesome thing. <laughs>